One of the outcomes of a values-based school is something called communicative competence. If you ever want to sell VBE to the local community, if it asks you what do you get from it, then communicative competence is number one. It's the number one that people in industry look for. It's the ability to get up and talk, uh, even if you don't know what you're about to talk about. <laughs> so, really great to be here. And, um, you know, I really feel emotional today because um, you are putting so much of the thinking of Bridget and Sue and the other uh, consultants uh, and associates actually into action. I've worked with some of you for many years. There's Tony Yu sitting here, who Tony and I have chatted about education for a long time. And there are some people in the room that I've only just met this morning. Um, I'm just overwhelmed with how the power of values-based education is finding its age. It's suddenly come of age because people throughout the world are saying, yes, we need this. Uh, the more extreme world politics gets, the more people like you and me say, hang on, hang on here, is this really where we want our world to come? And when you put up Eichmann, and I must be really old because I can remember his trial. And um, yeah, it really is a chilling remembrance of, of, of that. Um, so yeah. Yeah, this guy. Um, five minutes. Gosh, I'm going to talk quick. I'm not going to talk about Stephen Porges now. Uh, you'll have to look him up yourself. But this is the polyvagal theory. If you want to transform classrooms, Know about your vagus nerve. Many of you have heard me give talks when I talk about smiling eyes. I've been talking about smiling eyes for 20 years now, but I didn't have the scientific backup that I now have. What smiling eyes show is that you're, in, you're engaging the 10th cranial nerve, which is called the vagus nerve. There's two branches to it, an old branch and a new branch. The old branch goes to the mouth, the new branch goes to the eyes. Unfortunately, if we're walking into a fearful classroom where the kids are kicking off, the old branch of the vagus nerve is activated and we, we show how fearful we are of the children. If we feel good, if our relationships are good, we use our eyes and people communicate with the eyes. So I do commend Stephen Porges' uh, work Jane, a quickie on this, because this is a takeaway for you, a good idea to work with the children. Okay, yes. Oh, we like Russian dolls. You see me, you see me in the clothes I'm wearing, you see the external me, and you all have a thought and a, a sensation of maybe who I am. But I'm not just the external me, and now I'm going to do a little bit of juggling. Well, actually, no, could you could start to show the different parts of me. She's a bit squeaky. A bit squeaky. Yes. So you've seen the external me, but the first part I'm going to introduce you to is the, the part that, as a child, I think I got labelled as the one that was good at things, could do things, and she started to take on a lot of control and think she was the only person who could do really good jobs and that she was the best person at everything and potentially could be a bit critical. And. Uh, as in my adult life, I've, I've noticed that sometimes she thinks she's the only person who can load the dishwasher properly. And uh, fortunately, though, as I've done my internal work, she used to. She's transformed. She no longer, or very rarely, she has to be very stressed to come out critically. She now is really curious. And she's watching how everybody else does it and learning from them. So what I'm inviting us to realize is these different aspects of us will and can transform. So then we're going to go to another part of me. We now this is the little girl that loves sport. She was always doing things. And um, I started to realize that that was how I ran away from having to deal with any emotional pain in my life. And I literally did. I became a runner. I was quite good at it. Um, and it was always, if I had a problem, it was one of the ways I would distract myself. Maybe sometimes we'd sort the problem out, but maybe sometimes we wouldn't. I'd just feel a bit better because I'd gone for a run. But I've had to help her too because I've had lots of injuries in my sporting career and running is not possible at the moment. So she now has found so many other ways. First of all, when there is an emotional problem, 
I actually pay attention to it first so she doesn't have to take me away from it. But she's found yoga and she loves yoga. And, um, and she's also found that cycling her bike is great too. So another example of, of a part learning how to find its authentic best way to be. And I think we go a bit deeper in, okay, now this one, this one is the part that is very young, that at times felt ashamed of herself, became very scared of failing in school. I don't know what my primary school was doing, but very scared of not getting things right. She carries the shame, and she carries sometimes a sense of, of not being good enough. Um, and I really have to come alongside her even now. You might think, well, really? But yes, there are times when she gets triggered, might be a word we'd use, and I have to come alongside her with all my love and compassion, because underneath her, I hope I don't have a surprise, I think, ah, yeah. Can you see the sparkling diamond? Beneath her and within each and every one of us is this incredible essence of who you are. The essence that we fill that relational space with when we do it well. It's the part that has all of the curiosity, all of the compassion, all of my creativity, my courage, my, my willingness and, and love of connecting with people, not just in me, She's in every one of you, in every child, even the most the child that, you know, is the most challenging little soul you've ever met on this planet. Somewhere deep inside of them, this is waiting to shine again. And I know that in a values-based school, that's exactly what you're doing. You're helping your staff, you're helping yourself, you're helping the children connect with their true essence so that we will help humanity flourish. So thank you for that. And lastly, back to the school we're in. Uh, Aureus was one of the first schools really to embrace the concept of the inner curriculum. And there are two rooms which I had the privilege of opening, which are a part of the inner curriculum suite uh, upstairs. And this is one of my favorite uh, pictures of one of the students here in one of the rooms, one of the Thrive rooms. So our challenge, if we're creating a future, uh, Jane and I believe that the greatest challenge of all is to do with mental health. How can each one of us be as mentally stable as we can be so that we can authentically model out these values that we talk about? And in turn, how can the children also have enough mental health so that they can actually grow up to ensure that our world survives, it flourishes? That's the challenge we have. And therefore, I call you to, onto a revolution. The revolution that I started a long time ago called the Quiet Revolution, the revolution of the heart. Do not put up with things that are not in the interests of children. You know about child development. Please, I plea with you, please make sure in your schools you are developing children in the way that we know is best for them and best for society. Values-based education is a philosophy. It is a philosophy that's becoming dominant now in the system. And thanks to you, it's growing and growing and growing. Thank you for giving Jane and me the opportunity to speak before lunch, Sue. That's it. Thank you. As you can see, as you walk into the school, we've got our values. They are absolutely everywhere in the school. And so for the first few years, it was really important that I found a way to make sure that these things became real. So I took our values and what I did was I found a way to develop them into character traits. So I used 24 character traits by, I think it was Peter and Peterson and Seelman. And there's just 24 character traits and we chose just nine that aligned with our values. And so we no longer just spoke about love, hope and trust. We also spoke about fairness, respect, self-control. We believe the young people knew what these things meant more than maybe what love, hope and trust looked like in a school environment. 
And so for at least two years, we bombarded the school with lots of information until every young person could say, I know what the values are, they are love, hope and trust, even if they didn't know what that look, looked like or how to act upon them. So as part of, I was not part of senior leadership at that time, I was still working as a house coordinator and a secondment opportunity came up and the secondment opportunity was looking for a teacher. I approached the deputy at the time and I said, would you consider somebody that wasn't a teacher? And I know that you want to have a remit around teaching and learning. However, the way that our school is, I think that you need this. And I wrote a proposal around values in action and I was seconded to the senior leadership team to take that work forward. What was really important is making sure that it was part of the core business of our school and we had complete buy-in from our head teacher. It was really important. We use our values as common language, so I can speak to a young person about love. I can speak to them about hope, and I can speak to them about trust. And it's not unusual to hear those conversations in the corridor or in our classrooms. It was really important to get our staff on board. We had quite a challenging body of staff way back then, and it was really important that they learned how to show the values. They learned how to be consistent and were great role models. We also use our values, and I'm sure some of you do, to inspire student reflection. They aren't perfect. We all make mistakes, and we used our values to facilitate that process, and it works amazing. We also made sure in our classrooms we had dual purpose activities that went on. So every single teacher had to think about how their lessons contributed towards the values and, and vice versa. So at the beginning of every lesson on the starter slide, they listed numeracy focus, literacy focus, and also a values focus as well. Here are a few things that we did to make this journey work. Our first thing is consultation with stakeholders. Those values were chosen by our parents and our young people. It's really important that you get their buy-in. We rewrote all of our vision and mission statements to include our values. Our school improvement plan, I mean, we went, you know, we went to the extreme with this, but our school improvement plan, every single thing that we did referenced our values. It was really important for us that it was in there. Every single week for our assembly is based around a value. We don't just focus on the character traits that I showed you. We do expand them, but they still link to our values and we help our young people identify what that looks like. Marketing, posters and leaflets, absolutely everywhere so it becomes embedded, it's almost unconscious. And we also, on our sims, in terms of giving young people behaviour points, they get, they get points for showing values in action. On a daily basis, here are some of the things. So in our coaching time, we, I created lots of coaching time activities. And the first thing that we did was just teach young people about character, teach young people about forgiveness, self-control, perseverance and it, it definitely worked. They had debates in their classrooms about these different things and about the things that were affecting them in their lives. We also looked at role models and people that were doing these things really well in the real world. For the first few years, we don't do this at the moment, but for the first few years we had progress files where young people would look at their attainment and their progress, but also they would look at character and see how they were doing. As I said, every single teacher for their lesson had to make sure they linked their lesson to values and two years ago we wrote a school pledge which students say every single morning in coaching time that makes reference to academic and character excellence. We have A stars, our students, I was really surprised, I didn't think that our year 11s would want to wear badges but they absolutely love them and they have these little gold stars that they get for achieving five things over a half term. So they have to have 100% attendance, they have to achieve I think 10 positives and I can't remember the rest, but it works really well. And they get these badges and they wear them very proudly. Restorative practices are great in the school. And again, if something goes wrong, I always say to a young person, if you've been disrespectful or you've fallen out with somebody, we need to fix it. And we fix it using the values of love, hope and trust. When I came back from KIT, they had a character report. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great for coaches to do a character report on our students? And our coaches hated it. It was like, how, how can I even make a comment about somebody's perseverance or kindness in school? And the idea was it's about reflection, sitting with a young person and getting them to almost grade themselves on where they think 
So it's not really about the grade, it's more about the, the conversation and the reflection. And we, we use that in the early days, we no longer use it. Progress files I've mentioned, marketing, etc. On a termly basis, we have something called ACE Awards, Academic and Character Excellence Awards, and this is celebrating students at St Mark's and also staff. And these are the awards that they get on a termly basis, it's a great event, a great celebration, parents come along and there's lots of different things that go on. We also put a name of a student, I think a member of staff as well, onto our honours board, and those are the people who get the Values in Action Award. This year, September, I started a school within a school, and this leads from our values, and what I wanted to do was, I wanted to bring young people out of our local pupil referral unit. What we were finding is that young people were going to the local pupil referral unit, and unfortunately some of them were staying there, their behaviour was becoming worse, and some of them were getting introduced to offending behaviour, etc. I knew there were some young people that had been there for a very long time. I wondered whether, if we brought them into St Mark's, and we had a small provision for them, whether we could work with those young people and then get them back into mainstream school. We worked with our local pupil referral unit and we've now got 10 places for young people and the work has started and the transformation already in the last two months is pretty amazing. I've developed the three R's into now seven and so there's a programme that works with them to help them develop academic and character excellence. All they need, teachers and supporters and, and mentors, is some sort of therapy framework to maybe hang an idea on, on how we develop our personalities really. But I think so many teachers are such a long way down that path, the really good teachers are, because they know the importance of relationship, not just with the student, but themselves. They know if they say something that wasn't right and has perhaps hurt a child. So I think they're ready, they're open to it, and it's the next stage of education really, I think. 100%, absolutely, because it's, it's pulling in on the deep wisdom of humanity that's already really deep in values-based schools anyway, quotes and inspirational people. It's bringing in all the beautiful work that the interpersonal neurobiologists are working with, and we're sharing that in a simple language. So we want people to be curious about our brain, not just this part of the brain, but how it does connect to the whole body and then how it connects between you and me as well, you know, we're connected. Um, and then of course, great teaching. You know, teachers have got an incredible craft. They can take the most complex of, 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 of um, sort of theories and make them accessible to children. And I think that is such a skill. And then having some of the humanistic psychotherapists, particularly the internal family systems theory that we've really focused in on, it is just, it just speaks to the, to the truth of who we are as people really. So I think it's, it's just there. They're so excited. I think, you know, Neil and I were at a huge conference in London which was all for psychotherapists. And um, at the end of, of Richard Schwartz, who's from the Internal Family Systems Theory, he'd been talking, he sort of talked a bit about the work we're doing in education. We were swamped with therapists, really keen. They're, they've got their own children, they want to see this. In, in schools, a lot of them might be working with young people. And, you know, I think the whole concept of psychotherapy really is the healing of the soul. It's like helping the essence of humanity be at its best rather than contaminated with inappropriate beliefs about ourselves or serious or even minor experiences that haven't been integrated into the system. Some of the early therapists made it a language that was, you know, very difficult for people to access, but actually, that doesn't need to be a language of jargon. Um, it's, it's accessible to all of us, and that's the gift I hope we're leaving. 100%, it's relevant to absolutely every school. Um, mental illness comes in all sorts of different forms and can be very hidden in children. A joyousness does not necessarily just mean having fun. I believe children should enjoy a learning adventure, but the point of an adventure is that during that time, you submit yourself to some challenge. So, you know, the great adventurers uh, will all recognise that the fun is in getting ready in the anticipation. While you're actually on the adventure, while you're Shackleton's men stuck in the in South Antarctic, you're not really feeling that this is good fun. 
But when you get back and you're telling everybody what you went through, then it was good fun. And I think the learning sometimes has to be uphill against the wind through the brambles so that later you can look back and think, didn't I achieve a lot? So joyousness is the overall experience rather than the days where we're having fun. What the values work does is enable them to come back to their default position much quicker. They, it's like having another voice running in your head so that you've got the VBE voice that says to you, hang on here, just take a pause, slow down and return to your authentic self and then uh, talk again. So this is what educators, parents, communities are finding more and more. As my wife Jane said when she first came around values-based schools, she said there's a palpable different quality about values-based schools which is this what we call the essence of human beings as they, they can be. So what values-based education does is allow you to be the authentic you. So I'm seeing it everywhere now and it's a great thrill to me when teachers and others come up to me and say, wow, we, we actually see it works, Neil. What happens is that by reflecting on the way you are, so I can reflect on my personality and I think, oh yeah, I've got that aspect of me. Uh, does some things need the volume turned up? So through the seven pillars of values-based education, the student is introduced to a way of being which nurtures the authentic self. As um, child development colleagues will tell us, uh, when we enter the world, we have to learn to be in relationship with those who we meet. Now, in an ideal family, you will meet people who are nurturing, caring, but not all children have that. So we, we learn to adapt, and that means our authentic self has to be, in some way, emasculated. It's not allowed to show up. So we learn to be the goody-goody, or we learn to be the quiet one in the family. And that's what I mean by adaptive, adaption. So what the values-based classroom does, and school, is allow you to be who you were meant to be. It says, look, you, you have goodness, you have respect, you have cooperation. All these qualities are within you. They are a part of your essence. Yes, you have other bits of you that come back through thousands of years, which you can put a blanket term on called the shadow. But the values work helps you to be in control of that shadow and allows you to be who you're meant to be. And if we could only get everybody in the world just acting from their true essence, A, the people would feel better, they would have healthier and more wonderful lives, their relationships with other people would be vastly improved. So the, the, the benefits are just enormous. They actually want their country to succeed, to be successful in this world, to become a first world country. But they know that they can only do this if they have citizens who have their behaviours deeply rooted in, in positive values. Um, so they see it absolutely as the way forward for their country. You know, if you can start and develop in children um, humanity, integrity, um, honesty, cooperation in the young child, then maybe there's a hope for Nigeria in the future. Also, although many of the schools ha were, were practicing Islam as well, we've worked with both, and uh, VBE is equally acceptable to both the religions. In, in Thailand, uh, I think the attraction uh, of VBE is that it isn't linked to any faith, and therefore it's, it's applicable in an international school, which is where I was working. Um, and yet, it also sits very well with the Buddhist values, which of course is the national faith. So it, it sort of wins in, in both ways. And certainly the staff embrace the whole idea of role modeling and they could, they could see the power of that, of becoming positive role models. Um, although it may, it may be an area where they've got to work at it, but nevertheless, um, everyone was really positive about the message. 
so I, tips for anyone that's dealing with a challenging pupil. Uh, I think the most basic thing it comes down to is, is a relationship of taking the time to get to know the child, get to know the family, get to know the history and, and make them know that you care about them. It's not always easy and, and there's a lot of barriers to get through with that but none of it's ever going to be a quick fix and it, and it, it shouldn't be. It takes time, but I think they appreciate the time being taken on them, don't they? I know, obviously, with a lot of the work you do, it takes session after session. Yeah, you know? a lot of trust as a value, <laughs> um, a lot of compassion, a lot of listening, and also that just being there for them. So a lot of time you get, like, kind of, not attacked, but you kind of get things thrown at you all the time. And if you're just there, kind of surviving that for them, then that's teaching them that you're well many things but that you're going to be there and that it's one of the sort of the main tenets of the school is that, that we talk a lot we care a lot and we're there for them so if if that can be replicated and at any school you know we're very lucky the facilities we have are brilliant and they show the pupils that they're valued but a school is nothing without the people and that notion of a child at the center of everything everything around them saying we like you might not like everything you do but we like you you are important and I think that is replicable in any education setting. I, I would recommend the values-based approach to, to any school. Special schools, I think in particular, probably do quite a lot of it already intrinsically because of that sense of, of, of children having had a rough deal somewhere else and wanting them to feel that sense that they are able to be successful somewhere. Some of the, like, social and emotional yeah, the, the, values. Of... The, the nuts and bolts of you know, maths, English and science, none of that's going to be doable until they're able to feel safe, secure and the values. It's something which is always happening, but it's given us that kind of dialogue and that vocabulary to make it a bit more explicit. And that's amongst the staff and amongst the pupils and amongst the parents. And it just gives everyone a common kind of dialogue to talk about it and not sort of cramming it down anyone's throat, but just making it a thing which exists, which everybody buys into. Because without the staff modelling it and, and being authentic in it, the children see through that. They're very good at detecting when you don't mean it. And if they know you mean it, they will buy into it. And I think that's, that's the kind of message we give when we're speaking to other schools. Yeah, we're kind of doing it all the time, aren't we? But we do break it down. Like we've seen today, there's been lots of schools that break down values and they have values every half term. We do do that, but our values are kind of always there in the school and that's kind of... Because we were boarding school as well, those, those values are a 24-hour yeah. thing. They, they seamlessly move from the house groups in the morning into the school day, into reflection, into the evenings again. And it... it it's because of that wraparound that I think it becomes so effective for us. Okay, so I think the values-based education really helps because for a lot of our students, they can't cope in mainstream education, which means that they struggle with education generally. But a lot of them need the kind of values that we're teaching them in order to be able to engage in education. So trying to help them feel safe and secure, kind of... Well, because yeah, most of them have had such negative experience they feel that they have been failed in some way by the education system so the first I mean sometimes up to sort of year of being with this it's about them feeling comfortable them feeling safe them knowing it's okay to fail and building up some of those resiliences and realizing actually they are somewhere where the people care about them they're somewhere where they matter and they're somewhere where they are an important person they're part of something bigger they're not that kind of oddity, the one that's working down the hall on their own, or their, that sense of exclusion. We want them, we kind of bring them in, put them together, which is why our school's got so many sofas. It's that opportunity for the boys. They have to be together. They have to, and if they get it wrong, then the staff are there to we reflect and yeah, model and reflect and support them to get through it. Yeah. Keep supporting values-based education, because it's really the only education that's worth supporting. Thanks very much. All right.